This week's first chapter Friday is a new book that just came out. It's called Pony by R.J. Palacio. And she's the same author that wrote Wonder and all of the Wonder stories and White Bird, which is a graphic novel. So um, I'm very excited about this book. I just brought it home um, to read it myself. And I really like I've already halfway through because I couldn't stop reading. It's so good. A couple things I wanted to say about this book. First is I'm not sure which genre to put it in. Um, it has, it takes place in the past in the 1800s. So normally that would make it a historical fiction book, but it also has ghosts in it. Um, they're not like scary, creepy, evil ghosts per se, but there are lots of ghosts in the book. So that would put it in paranormal and horror. And then the other thing is that it is a journey story that involves a a horse, a pony. And that normally, a book like that, oftentimes I will put in the adventure section. So maybe you can let me know what you think, um, which genre you think this book should go in. Another thing I want to say about this book is that um, in, it's a little different from the wonder books in the sense that it's um, got a lot of um, sort of big words and complex vocabulary in it. So um, a lot of times writers use more complex vocabulary when they want to provide more richness and detail to the story. And um, I found, I, I think that if you, if you, um, you may want to read this book with a dictionary in hand um, or a dictionary app on your, on your device um, in case you want to look up some of the words. I also noticed um, there's a really cool thing in this book. And these are the pictures at the beginning of every chapter. Here's another one. And these are called a kind of photography called a daguerreotype. And I had to actually look that up. So when we're talking about complex vocabulary, I had seen the word before, but I didn't know how to pronounce it. So I had to look it up. It's a French word. And um, I also spent some time reading about what it is because it's something that I, I don't know anything about. It's an old fashion style of photography, very early um, in the, some, one of the earliest kinds of photography that involved using glass plates and a bunch of chemicals to try to transfer an image and capture an image. And so that's why they're black and white. Um, and one thing I like um, uh, when I get books like this that have things in them, and I've had to look up several things in this book just because I was curious about them. When there are things that I have not encountered in my life, it is fun um, when you encounter them in a book and it um, kind of sparks that curiosity and makes you want to look something up. So already I'm really loving this book. There's a lot going on in this story. Okay, so I'm going to read actually the first two chapters because they're really short. Um, the dedication of this book says, um, for my mother and the very first daguerreotype has a quote under it, which reads, our natures can't be spoken by Margot Liv Livesey, Eva moves the furniture. I don't know what that means either. And then there's a poem. It's actually a song lyrics. Fare thee well, I must be gone and leave you for a while. But wherever I go, I will return if I go 10,000 miles, 10,000 miles, my own true love, 10,000 miles or more. And the rocks may melt and the seas may burn if I no more return. Oh, come back, my own true love, and stay a while with me. For if I had a friend all on this earth, you've been a friend to me. And that is by Anonymous. Anonymous means we don't know who wrote it. And the name of the song is Fare Thee Well. Um, so then there's chapter one at the beginning of chapter one, there's another daguerreotype and another quote that says, I have left Ithaca to seek him by Francois Fenelon, the adventures of Telemachus, 1699. And then at the beginning of this first chapter is also an excerpt from a, um, a newspaper article, and this is what it says, from the Boneville Courier, April 27th, 1858. A country boy of 10 living near Boneville was recently walking to his house in the vicinity of a large oak tree when a violent storm arose. The boy took refuge beneath the tree scant moments before it was struck by lightning, sending the boy tumbling to the earth as if lifeless, his clothes smoked to cinders. 
Fortune smiled upon the child that day, however, for his quick-witted father, having witnessed the event, was able to revive him by means of a fireplace bellows. The child remained unaltered by the experience afterward, but for one peculiar souvenir. An image of the tree had become emblazoned upon his back. This daguerreotype by lightning is one of several documented in recent years, making it yet another wondrous curiosity of science. So, of course, I'm super curious about this. Um, I looked up the Boneville Courier, and while Boneville is a real place, I couldn't tell for sure if there really was a newspaper called the Boneville Courier. But then I looked up daguerreotype lightning or lightning daguer daguerreotype, and I did find some information. I don't know how um, true it is, but claiming that it's a thing. So believe what you will. Okay, chapter one. It was my bout with lightning that inspired Pa to become immersed in the photographic sciences, which is how this all began. Pa had always had a natural curiosity about photography, having come from Scotland, where such arts flourish. He dabbled in daguerreotypes for a short while after settling in Ohio, a region naturally full of salt springs, from which comes the agent bromine, an essential component of the developing process. But daguerreotypes are an expensive enterprise that turned very little profit, and Pa did not have the means to pursue it. People haven't the money for delicate souvenirs, he reasoned, <clears throat> which is why he became a bootmaker. People always have a need for boots, he said. Pa's specialty was the calf-high wellington in grain leather, to which he added a secret compartment in the heel for the storing of tobacco or a pocket knife. This convenience was greatly desired by customers, so we got by pretty well on those boot orders. Pa worked in the shed next to the barn, and once a month traveled to Boneville with a cart full of boots, pulled by Mule, our mule. But after a lightning imprinted my back with the image of the oak tree, Pa once again turned his attention to the science of photography. It was his belief that the image on my skin had come there as a consequence of the same chemical reactions at play in photography. The human body, he told me, as I watched him mixing chemicals that smelled of rotten eggs and cider vinegar, is a vessel full of the same mysterious substances, subject to the same physical laws as everything else in the universe. If an image can be preserved by the action of light upon your body, it can be preserved by the same action upon paper. That is why it was not daguerreotypes that drew his interest anymore, but a new form of photography involving paper soaked in a solution of iron and salt to which is transferred by means of sunlight a positive image from a glass negative. Pa quickly mastered the new science and became a highly regarded practitioner of the collodion process, as it was called, an art form hardly seen in these parts. It was a bold field, requiring great experimentation and resulting in pictures most astounding in their beauty. Pa's iron types, as he called them, had none of the exactitude of daguerreotypes, but were imbued with the subtle shadings that made them look like charcoal art. He used his own proprietary formula for the sensitizer, which is where the bromine came in, and applied for a patent before opening a studio in Boneville, down the road from the courthouse. In no time at all, his iron-dusted paper portraits became quite the rage around here, for not only were they infinitely cheaper than daguerreotypes, but they could be reproduced over and over again from a single negative. Adding even more to their allure, and for an extra charge, Pa would tint them with a mix of egg wash and colored pigment, which gave them a lifelike semblance most extraordinary to behold. People traveled from all over to have their portraits taken. One fancy lady came all the way from Akron for a sitting. That's in Ohio. I assisted in Pa's studio, adjusting the skylight and cleaning the focusing plates. A few times, Pa even let me polish the new brass portrait lens, which had been a major investment in the business and required delicacy in its handling. Such had our circumstances turned, Pa's and mine, that he was contemplating selling his boot-making enterprise altogether, for he said he much preferred the smell of mixing potions to the stink of people's feet. It was at this time that our lives were forever changed by the pre-dawn visitation of three riders and a bald-faced pony. Chapter 2. Mittenwool was the one who roused me from my deep slumber that night. Silas, awake now. There are riders coming this way, he said. I would be lying if I said I was jolted up right away to my feet by the urgency of his call. But I did no such thing. I simply mumbled something and turned in my bed. 
He nudged me hard then, which is not a simple feat for him. Ghosts do not easily maneuver in the material world. Let me sleep, I answered grumpily. It was then that I heard Argus howling like a banshee downstairs and Pa cock a rifle. I looked out the tiny window next to my bed, but it was black as night, black as ink night, and I could see nothing. There are three of them, said Mittenwill, squinting over my shoulder through the same window. Pa, I called out, jumping down from the loft. He was ready, boots on, peering through the front window. Stay down, Silas, he cautioned. Should I light the lamp? No. Did you see them from your window? How many are there? he asked. I didn't see them myself, but Mittenwool says there are three of them. Guns drawn, Mittenwool added. They have their guns drawn, I said. What do they want, Pa? Pa didn't answer. We could hear the galloping coming toward us now. Pa cracked the front door open, rifle at the ready. He threw on his coat and turned to look at me. You don't come out, Silas, no matter what, he said, his voice stern. If there's trouble, you run over to Havelock's house, out the back through the fields. You hear me? You're not going out there, are you? Get a hold of Argus, he answered. Don't let him out. I collared Argus. You're not going out there, are you? I asked again, frightened. He did not stop to answer me, but opened the door and ventured out to the porch, aiming his rifle toward the approaching riders. He was a brave man, my pa. I pulled Argus close to me and then crept over to the front window and peeked out. I saw the men advance. Three riders, just like Mittenwill had said. Behind one of them trailed a fourth horse, a giant black charger, and next to it, the pony with a bone-white face. The horsemen slowed down as they approached the house, in deference to Pa's rifle. The leader of the three, a man in a yellow duster on a spotted horse, put his arms up in the air in a peaceful gesture as he brought his steed to a full stop. Ho there, he said to Pa, not forty feet from the porch. You can put down your weapon, mister. I come in peace. Put yours down first, Pa answered, his rifle shouldered. Mine? The man looked theatrically as his, at his own empty hands, and then left and right, making a show of only now noting his companion's drawn weapons. Put those down, boys. You're making a bad impression. He turned back to Pa. Sorry about that. They mean no harm, just a force of habit. Who are you, Pa said. Are you Mac Boat? Pa shook his head. Who are you? Come storming here in the middle of the night. The yellow duster man did not seem afraid of Pa's rifle in the least. I could not see him well in the dark, but I judged him to be smaller than Pa, Pa being one of the tallest men in Boneville. Younger, too. He wore a derby hat like gentlemen do, but he wasn't one as far as I could see. He looked like a ruffian, pointy-bearded. Now, don't get riled, he said, his voice light. My boys and I meant to arrive at sunup, but we made better time than we thought. I'm Rufa Jones, and these are Seb and Eben Morton. Don't bother trying to tell them apart. It's impossible. It was only then that I noted the two hulking men were exact duplicates of each other, wearing identical melon hats with wide bands down low over their moon-round faces. We've come here with an interesting proposition from our boss, Roscoe Ollerenshaw. You heard of him, I'm sure? Pa made no response to that. Well, Mr. Ollerenshaw knows of you, Mac Boat, Rufa Jones continued. Who's Mac Boat? Mittenwell whispered to me. I don't know any Mac Boat, Pa said from behind his rifle. I am Martin Bird. Of course, Rufa Jones answered quickly, nodding. Martin Bird, the photographer. Mr. Ollerenshaw is very familiar with your work. That's why we're here, you see. He has a business proposition that he'd like to discuss with you. We've come a long way to talk to you. Might we come inside for a bit? We've been riding all night. My bones are chilled. He raised the collar on his duster to illustrate the point. If you want to talk business, you come to my studio in the daylight hours like any civilized man would, Pa said. Now why would you adopt that tone with me, Rufa Jones asked, as if perplexed. The nature of our business requires some privacy, is all. We mean you no harm, not you or your boy, Silas. That's him hovering by the window behind you, right? I swallowed hard, I'm not going to lie, and pulled my head back from the window. Mittenwool, who was beside, behind me, nudged me to crouch down farther. You have five seconds to get off my property, Pa warned. 
and I could tell from his voice that he meant it. But Rufa Jones must not have heard the threatening tone in Pa's words, for he laughed. Now, now, don't get vexed. I'm just the messenger here, he, plied, he replied calmly. Mr. Ollerenshaw sent us to come get you, and that's what we're doing. Like I said, he means you no harm. In fact, he wants to help you. He wanted me to tell you there's a lot of money in it for you. A small fortune were his exact words. For very little inconvenience on your part. Just a week's work and you'll be a rich man. We even brought you horses to ride. A nice big one for you and a fetching little one for your boy. Mr. Ollerenshaw is something of a horse collector, so you should consider it an honor that he's letting you ride his fine steeds. I'm not interested. You now have three seconds to leave, answered Pa. Two. All right, all right, said Rufa Jones, waving his hands in the air. We'll leave. Don't you worry. Come on, fellas. He pulled on his horse's reins and circled around, as did the brothers, wheeling the two riderless horses behind them. They started slow walking into the night away from the house, but after a few steps, Rufa Jones stopped. He held his arms out to his sides, crucifixion-like, to show that he was still unarmed. Then he looked over his shoulder at Pa. But we'll only come back tomorrow, he said, with a lot more men. Mr. Ollerenshaw is not going to give up easily, truth be told. I came in peace tonight, but I can't promise it'll be the same tomorrow. Mr. Ollerenshaw, well, he wants what he wants. I'll get the sheriff involved, threatened Pa. Will you, Mr. Boat? said Rufa Jones. His voice sounded more menacing now. It had none of the previous lightness. The name is Bird, said Pa. Right. Martin Bird, the photographer of Boneville, who lives way out in the middle of nowhere with his son, Silas Bird. You best get, rasped Pa. All right, answered Rufa Jones, but he didn't spur his horse. I was watching all this, breathless, mitten wool right next to me. A few seconds passed. No one moved or said a word.